Good morning to the people of God, all who have gathered this morning, the people of God, we praise God for you. Praise God for all who are listening to us by way of live stream. It is good to be in the house of the Lord together one more time. I stand for a call to worship. The 77th division of Psalm. A psalm of praise in the, in the day of trouble. I seek the Lord. Listen very carefully and read along with me as the psalmist opens his heart up to us. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. Selah. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Selah. Meditate. Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. Something's changing here on the inside. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. My goodness. Look at our God. The clouds poured out water. The, the skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Watch this, saints. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. <laughs> you led your flock, you, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. That's him, isn't it? I will lift up my voice my heart in praise to the sovereign, almighty, righteous, holy, just King, and I shall bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name, for the Lord our God is worthy. 
Let's, bl let's bless his name together. Oh, these will come and pray for us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, you have amazed us. Lord, you have amazed us with your word. Lord, you have amazed us with your work. Lord, you in your grace and in your mercy, Lord, you have seen to it that you have gathered us together once again by your grace. Lord, you and you alone have drawn us, individual families, individual members, once again to this place. Lord, that we might see, Lord, that we might hear, that we might know your word. Lord, that we might come together, Lord, to encourage, we might come together to edify, Lord, that we might come together and see one another face to face. Lord, that we might see the hurt in some. Lord, that we might see the joy in others. Lord, that we might recognize that we are a body of Christ, Lord, who is living. Lord, who is dwelling in a world that has fallen. Lord, that we might recognize once again that you are sovereign, you are holy, you are righteous, you are majestic. You are purpose, perfect in all of your ways. Lord, that once again that we might see ourselves as you see us. Lord, that we might be humble. Lord, so we this morning, your people, Lord, those who you from eternity past have known, Lord, who you have called, Lord, that you shall make us holy and blameless and you shall conform us to the image of your Son. Lord, this morning as we gather together, Lord, we ask a miracle from you. Lord, every time we gather together, we require a miracle. Lord, before our bodies are fallen, our minds are corrupt, Lord, we, we think of things of this world. Lord, we, we scatter. Lord, we wander. Lord, these old bones are decrepit and decaying. Lord, so we require, require a miracle every time we come together if we are to worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, so I pray this morning, Lord, bring that miracle unto us. Lord, grant us to see and to know who you are. Lord, grant us to love you. Lord, to be stirred within our soul, within our spirit. And Lord, grant us to show this world and to show one another how great and how sovereign and how majestic you are. Lord, grant us, Lord, a miracle this morning. Lord, that when we leave this place, Lord, when we walk out these doors, Lord, we know that we have been together with the body of Christ. Lord, we know that we have been together with the sovereign God. Lord, that the look upon our face glows. Lord, the actions within our life shows this world, Lord, exactly who you are. Lord, that when we leave this place, Lord, we are faced with the truth and the reality of your person and your work. And we just simply have to say, God, you are good. God, you are gracious. God, you are merciful. And Lord, that cannot happen without a miracle from you this morning. Lord, so work your work as you always do. Work your work as you have worked throughout the history of mankind. Lord, when man has been dead, when man has wandered, when man needs to be gathered together to see your grace and see your mercy, Lord, do that this morning. Do that this morning amongst your people. Lord, you are sovereign and you are holy. You are perfect in your ways. To you we humbly bow today. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise, Praise the Lord, everybody. Yes. Praise the Lord who is out there um, watching the live stream. If you don't mind, which I hope you don't, 
So we all just looking for y'all already know the drill. <laughs> just stand up on our feet and let's worship the Lord this morning. Come on, everybody, clap those hands together. Says, clap your hands, all ye people. 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 Lift your hands in the sanctuary. 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 Shout to God with the voice of triumph. 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 Oh. If this is what you came to do, say, everybody pray. Come on, say, everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Come on, everybody pray. Everybody pray. We're going to do that again. Clap your hands, all ye people. I'll see y'all clapping. Clap your hands, all ye people. 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 Lift your hands in the sanctuary. 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 Shout to God with the voice of triumph. 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 Oh, if this is what you came to do, say everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. I can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. I can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Cause I can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Said I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Said I can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Said I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Said I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Oh, y'all looking, but y'all not clapping this morning. It's all right, I clap for my sins. The song says, everybody pray. Now, if you know you have breath in your body, come on and lift your voice with us. So I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Said I can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. I can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Said I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Said I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. I can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Said I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Can't stop praising. 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 Can't st
stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. It's so good to be. I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't 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 stop praising. You've been good to me. Can't stop praising. You've been good to me. Can't stop praising. You've been great. Can't stop praising. You've been so kind. Can't stop praising. I can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. You are good. Can't stop praising. You are good. I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't Put stop our hands together for Jesus. Can y'all say this with us? Won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. I can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. I won't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Everybody pray. 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 What you came to do, say. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Choir leading us to worship and praise of our great God and King. And I join them in saying, I will not stop praising. My, my legs might give out and I can't walk, <laughs> but I will not stop praising Him. might not be able to lift my hands one day, but I will not stop praising the Lord. God bless the RBC Choir for leading us as to do what the psalmists say do. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you this morning, more of the people of God coming out, and amen. And it really needs to be that way, for the Lord has called us to this. Well, Mark's Gospel, chapter 15,
Mark's Gospel, chapter 15. Today in preaching, I want to preach verses 6 through 14 from Mark's Gospel. I'll read verses 6 through 15. we continue this, this study. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they ask. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. The crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. That's the word of the living God. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this holy gathering of your people. To worship you. We gather for that purpose. To worship you. In the reading of your word, we worship you praying your word, we worship you as we sing your word. Now, Heavenly Father, we worship you as we preach your word. Give your servant grace. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me with knowledge of your will in wisdom and understanding. May your word dwell in me richly as you feel me and pour out of me nothing but your word. Your people, your sheep need to hear your word. So I pray that you would strengthen. I pray that you would edify. I pray that you would encourage. I pray that you would comfort. I pray that you would rebuke. I pray that you would reprove. I pray that you would instruct in righteousness. I pray that you would bring your people to repentance, faith, resting in the word of Christ alone. I pray that you would say, in addition to sanctifying. Lord, what I'm asking, I cannot bring to pass. Only you, using a finite man like me, only you can bring that to pass. So as I preach, only you should get the glory. The honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Looking at the trials of Jesus, I'm tagging this text, what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? We have been looking, studying, as I preach Jesus before Pilate, or Pilate before Jesus, this, this trial that Jesus is in, he's on his way to Calvary, and we have been looking at this chronologically, the order in which it happened. At this point in Mark's gospel, Pilate has a serious problem. Here's his problem, the essence of his problem. What is he going to do with Jesus? Jesus had already be appeared before the Roman governor once that morning for judgment after hearing the accusations against him and after interrogating uh, uh, Jesus for himself, Pilate declared his judicial verdict, Jesus was innocent. The problem was that some people still wanted Jesus dead and thus they would not accept his legal decision. So what was Pilate going to do with this righteous, innocent man? By this point in Mark's gospel, the governor, Pilate, had already made several attempts to resolve this dilemma. You remember? First, he had tried to say that this was a matter for the local religious leaders to settle in their own courts. Don't bring it to my court. You settled it in your own. But the Jewish leaders uh, responded that they had determined that Jesus should die. And only the Romans had the power of the sword to kill so they brought the case back to Pilate. Next, you remember the, the governor uh, declared that Jesus was innocent, which should have ended the trial, right? But this was not the verdict that the enemies of Christ wanted to hear, so they kept calling for his execution. It started spitting out a barrage of accusations we saw in verse 3 of chapter 15. Then Pilate picked up on the fact that Jesus was from Galilee, which meant, oops, he's under someone else's jurisdiction. I'll just send him over to Herod. I will not preach that trial to you. We'll catch that on another time. But Herod examined and interrogated and he couldn't find anything wrong either. <laughs> so the next thing Pilate knew, Jesus was back in front of him again and the problem was still not solved. How many of you know that you keep getting faced with Jesus? What will I do with Jesus? Will I bow before him in submission to his lordship uh, uh, and, and, and saving and rescuing me from the domain of darkness, from my sinful life, or will I reject him? You have to answer that question. What will you do? With Jesus. 
As you have heard me say in many, on many occasions, you can receive him as Lord of your life or you, you can reject him. But there's one thing you can't do with Jesus. That's skip him. You can't skip Jesus. You can skip basketball practice. You can skip school. You can skip work. But you can't skip Jesus. This is a question this morning that every one of us must answer. I want to preach this passage this morning, and I want you to see uh, how the author's thought, Mark, builds up to this climax of the crowd crying, crucify him. I want you to see the author's flow of thought here. I want you to understand what's going on in this text. And I want you to submit in faith and repentance to the Lordship of Christ over your life. I want you to to do that if you're not saved. I want you to do that if you are saved. Let me walk you through this text, okay? Something's going on in verse 6 through 8 of Mark's Gospel, chapter 15. This is after Hera sent Jesus back to Pilate. This is after that. First of all, we, I want you to see the, the practice of release. There's a practice here that is discussed in verses 6 through 8. The practice of release. First of all, in verse 6, the scripture tells us about the custom of the day. In that culture, in that culture, the custom of the day, there was a custom that was observed. Listen to it very carefully. Now, at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. Now, at the feast, he used to release to them one prisoner for whom they asked. So this is a custom that normally happened. What the, notice what the custom involved. What occurred in this release was a pardon of some Jewish prisoner whom Rome had previously arrested and imprisoned. In ruling other nations, the Romans observed some of the customs and practices of the people as a gesture to appease them, the Jewish people. Scripture records the fact that the custom existed and was observed in the time of Christ by the Romans. The Jews would not let the Romans forget the custom, obviously. The Jews hated Roman rule of their country and getting a Jewish prisoner freed every year gave them some satisfaction. This was especially so if the Jewish prisoner was guilty of insurrection against the Roman government, such as Barabbas was, who was involved in this particular release, which Pilate and the crowd debated, as we will see. It's what the custom involved. When did it occur? Well, the text says during the feast. What feast? The Passover. The Passover feast. During the Passover, Jerusalem would be filled with uh, multitudes of Jewish people who had come to celebrate the Passover. The Romans were often fearful of a riot. So they would view this release as a pacifier 
to cool off any hotheads that might be in Jerusalem at the time. It is appropriate that this custom was especially repeated or related, excuse me, to the Passover. You know what happened at the Passover. The Jews were delivered out of Egypt, the Exodus. Blood on the doorposts, right? The angel of death passed over all who had blood on the doorposts. So it would help commemorate the deliverance of the Jews from Egypt. Perhaps it was even a memorial of the great national deliverance then of the escape from Egypt, which was celebrated at the feast of the Passover. So it occurred during the Passover, this custom. Who made the choice? Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they ask. So the custom gave the Jews the choice of whom they wanted released. The choice of who was to be released was the people's choice, not Pilate's choice. The people made it a practice to request a specific individual. The text says, whom they asked, that indicates that the prize point in the custom lay in the selection of the prisoner by the Jews themselves. They will decide who gets released. That was favored to the people because they lived under a dictatorial government. But Pilate saw he was really seeking to solve the court issue about Christ by having him to be the one chosen for release. Now, Pilate should have released Jesus anyway, do you agree? Because Christ was innocent of no wrongdoing. He, he, he was not guilty. Pilate could have granted the people their choice and still not given Christ over to be crucified. The choice of whom the people wanted, as we will see, only required Pilate to release Barabbas. It did not require Pilate to condemn Christ to crucifixion. Stay with me. Pilate had no obligation to do as the people said in regards to the crucifixion. Pilate's fault is not in releasing Barabbas, but Pilate's fault is in condemning Christ to be crucified. That's the custom of the day. We'll see what it involved, when, and who made the choice. But the Bible also shows us the chronomal identified. The chronomal identified as we think together about the practice of release. There's a custom and there's a criminal to be identified. Who is the criminal? Verse 7. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. He wasn't the only one in prison. He was among the rebels in prison. Now, verse 6 sets forth the custom that came into operation during the trial. Here, information is given concerning the notorious prisoner. That's what Matthew calls him in Matthew 27, 16. Barabbas is said to be here in prison with the rebels who had committed murder in the insurrection. Mark, Mark here lets us know that this Rebellion, whatever, whenever it occurred, was a well-known incident. We cannot identify it more specifically, but it was obviously well-known to the people. There were many movements, saints. There were many opposition movements and violent demonstrations against the Romans in first century Palestine. 
There were insurrection movements and robbers who robbed the wealthy Romans and gave to the poor. Luke 23, 19 uh, refers to this particular event as having happened in the city, Jerusalem. It's well known. So we can conclude that Barabbas was probably a member of one of the insurrection groups that engaged in violent resistance to the Romans. That, in other words, they sought to overthrow Roman government. We have every reason to believe that the two thieves that was crucified with Jesus were members of the same group. Stay with me. So, he was guilty of opposing the Romans, which the Jews were accusing Christ of also doing. Hmm. There are things when you read in Scripture makes you go, hmm. He was guilty of the very uh, crime that they tried to fasten on Jesus for his condemnation. You, you remember in Luke 23, 2, we read it last week. And they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to, to give tribute to, to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Hmm. The name Barabbas means son of Abba <laughs> or son of his father. His father could have been a rabbi. It is a name identifying, actually, a person's father. Here, the law-breaking son of a human father is being offered to the people in, in the place of the sinless son of the divine father. <laughs> hmm. That's the criminal identified. Are you walking with me? We see the custom of the day. We see the criminal identified. The custom was released. Uh, one of the prisoners during the feast, right? The criminal identified is Barabbas. Thirdly, we see in this practice of release, the cry of the crowd. And don't get this mixed up in verse 8. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. Initially, the cry of the crowd doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. Okay? The crowd at this point is not trying to get Jesus. They're just trying to get a custom. They're just trying to get Pilate to go by the normal custom. Now, the crowd of Jews came up. That, that means they arrived at the praetorium uh, in Herod's formal palace. According to uh, John 19 and 3, Jesus was tried by Pilate at a place called the Stone Pavement. That's the Aramaic word for which Gabbatha means high point, high point. So Herod's place a palace was situated on the prominent western hill of Jerusalem to which the crowds would have to come up before Pilate. That's where Pilate was. Came up, suggests that when they came up, Pilate was seated on his elevated judge's seat when they approached. Now the crowd is not the crowd of, of chapter 14, verse 43, who had arrested Jesus because no one would have had to stir up that crowd, right? Verse 11, no one would have had to stir up the crowd that arrested Jesus. They're already against him. This is not the same crowd. Mark doesn't comment on the composition of the crowd, but it is plausible to assume that they were inhabitants of Jerusalem, festival pilgrims pur getting ready for Passover. And it's easy to say or try to conclude that this is the exact same crowd that cried Hosanna. Well, probably some of those people were in that crowd, but you can't conclude that. Okay. These are people, inhabitants of Jerusalem, festival pilgrims getting ready for Passover. 
Mark's words here stress that the people took the initiative in urging Pilate to observe the usual custom. Again, just urging him to observe the usual custom. They just asked, Pilate, do what you normally do for us during the feast. Release a Jewish prisoner. That's the practice of release. Follow me. We move from the practice of release to verse 9 and 10, and we see next the proposal for release. Pilate is thinking this thing through. In verse 9, we see Pilate's sympathy for Jesus. They say, G they say Pilate, do what you normally do. Release a Jewish prisoner. And Pilate says, hmm, here it is. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? <laughs> Pilate is hoping that uh, the ordinary people would at least listen to reason. So he says, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? Pilate has found him innocent. Herod has found him innocent. And normally these two men agreed on nothing, but they both agreed that Jesus was innocent. So do you want, want me to release Jesus, the king of the Jews? You know what's clear here? Pilate does not want to make a decision over Jesus so he's seeking some way to release him. Pilate is convinced Jesus is innocent. Pilate does not want to condemn Jesus, but yet he knew politically he had to do something to appease the Jews. I can't just release them. I want to appease them. So he grabs the custom. He puts the matter in the people's hands. Do you want me to release Jesus? Pilate named him king of the Jews. That was simply to express contempt for them, for the religious leaders. Verse 10, we'll get to in a moment. Now, Give Pilate too much credit in this sympathy, okay? He should have released Jesus. He's been held against the law. He was innocent, and his release was warranted by law. Yet, 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 yes, demanded by law. So, his preference was in accord with law and with ju justice. He should have released Jesus, right? But he wants it. He won't, he, he won't stand to do what he knows he should do. <laughs> Pilate's wife, Mrs. Pilate, she had this dream, obviously about Jesus. And according to Matthew 27, 19, she, she sent this message to Pilate. She said, have nothing to do with this righteous man. Bag off of that, Pilate. <laughs> <It's>, it, <laughs> you don't need to be messing with this guy. <laughs> so Pilate has sympathy, but sympathy is not enough. You see Jesus hanging on the cross and you have sympathy for him dying that way? But Jesus doesn't want or need our sympathy, bow to the lordship of the crucified and risen Savior. Pilate has sympathy, but sympathy is not enough. And notice, not only we see his sympathy, but we see his, I just wanted another S, okay. 
It's an old word, okay? Shrewdness. Where do we see that? Notice verse 10. Just walking you through. All you have to do is follow me in the text. For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. And what I mean by shrewdness, I just mean Pilate's ability to judge and see why the chief priest delivered Jesus up. He can see that. A little word for at the beginning of verse 10, that's explanatory. Here's why he's asking for the release of Jesus, because of what he saw to be the truth. He saw what was going on. That word perceive means to become aware of something through your senses. He came to know and understand what was going on. And he says, they're doing this all out of envy. You know what envy is? It refers to spite and resistment towards the success or possessions of another. Spite and resistance toward the success or possessions of another. See, envy is grief or anger caused by somebody else's success. It refers to spite and resentment, right? It, it, it is another reverse testimony to Jesus' exalted status and integrity which causes the high priest envy. So the charge of the priests did not deceive Pilate. They're doing this out of envy. Uh, Jesus has become very influential and uh, popular among the uh, common people. So the religious leaders are envious and jealous of what they see. And the governor saw it. He saw it. He saw the motives behind why they brought Christ to him in the first place. He saw and knew that it had nothing to do with any criminal offense. It's just envy. Hearts. So, here's what Pilate is trying to do. He's trying to pit the interests of the common people in Jesus against the Jewish leaders. Okay? He's trying to get them to go against the Jewish leaders, you know, the chief priests, you know, the Sanhedrin, the elders, and the scribes. But watch this. Just by way of little application, he could see the envy, the jealousy of the religious leaders, but he couldn't see the truth standing in front of him. He could see, watch this, the sin of others, but he couldn't see his own sin standing in front of the truth, who is Christ. Can't linger there. I'm just walking right now. <laughs> I'm just walking through here. I got to behave this morning. <laughs> so, what do we see so far? We see the practice of release. That helps us understand what's going on here and what Pilate is trying to do. We see the proposal for release because Pilate wants to use the custom to get Jesus released because he does not have the courage to stand and judge righteously. So he's trying to pit the common people against the religious people and let the people decide what their choice is. Because these guys are just envious. But I'm basically a good person. Put that in parentheses. <laughs> I'm basically a good person. I'm not like them. Well, like them, you need Jesus. And you better decide what you will do with Jesus. Thirdly, are you with me? Follow me now. This is good. Notice thirdly, the preferences for release. The preferences for release. Now surely, if there's someone to be released, surely the 
the majority will not choose to have a notorious prisoner like Barabbas released over Jesus. Surely not, right? Let's see. The chief priests want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Follow me. Notice the beloved in verse 11. Notice the influence of the chief priests. In verse 11, Mark 15, verse 11. Did I say Mark 15, verse 11? Yeah, notice the influence. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. Now, remember, he had just said, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And the chief priest said, uh-oh. He's about to mess something up here. So, the Bible says that they stirred up. That word stirred up is an interesting word. It literally means shook up, caused to quake, caused turmoil, to incite. It, it is a picture of the impact that the chief priests had on the crowd. They shook them up. <laughs> they incited them. They stirred up the multitude. Matthew writes, only persuaded the multitude. Mark writes, they stirred them up, and he mentions that it was the high priest. Those, those guys are supposed to be teaching the Bible, you know that? Mark wants us to understand both here, verse 11, and in verse 10, that, that the high priests, these religious boys, dominated the situation and had control over the rest of the Sanhedrin, and now they're doing crowd control. They got busy. They still walking around. Tell them to release the rebels. Hi, I'm the high priest, and I've been the high priest here in Jerusalem for a number of years, uh, teaching the Bible, understanding well the law of Moses, and in this case, uh, Barabbas needs to be released. <laughs> That's their goal, isn't it? They have one goal. Kill Jesus, release Barabbas. In other words, Barabbas was preferable. Stay with me. The people, the crowd, was receptive to what the leaders were saying. Don't you wonder why? Well, everybody has heard of Jesus. He's the one that we expected to overthrow the Romans and to establish uh, messianic kingdoms standing before the Roman governor, a helpless prisoner. Oh, oh yeah, we, we know him. He can't be a true Messiah in their minds. He wouldn't endure such indignities. So, the disappointing in his failure as they had anticipated. He didn't do what they wanted him to do, so they turned fiercely against him. You know, people would do that, right? He was such a helpless king of the Jews. We don't want anything to do with him. At least Barabbas tried to do what they believed Jesus might have done but refused to do. So, give us Barabbas. Because he's not like we wanted him to be. We don't want that type of king. We don't like his way of ruling and reigning over us. We don't want him. Give us Barabbas. So they're excited. I mean, they're incited, 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 stirred up, persuaded, strongly influenced, but yet they have to make their own choice. Before I go to verse 12, I need to ask you something right now. 
Who's stirring you up? Who incites your heart? Who's dominant? Who is the dominant person that stirs you up? I'm talking to you Christians right now. Is it the Holy Spirit? Who indwells us? Who must feel us? Who must control our minds by his word? Or is it your flesh? If you walk in the spirit, you will not carry out the desires of your flesh, which are always sinful. Who's stirring you up? Who's stirring you up in regarding to decisions regarding sanctification, how you are to live? Identify who's stirring you up to go against Christ. It's not good. It's not righteous. It's not holy. It's not God's will. Who's stirring you up? May I get a little more personal? In the midst of this pandemic, who's stirring you up? Who has the dominant persuasion over your heart? Is it the CDC? If you do not have serious underlying conditions, shouldn't you be attending? Shouldn't you be obeying the command of Hebrews 10, 24, 25? A command that says, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Shouldn't you be yielding to the spirit to obey that command? Who's stirring you up? I am not saying we shouldn't follow CDC guidelines. Yes, I am not saying we shouldn't respect local or state government. Yes, but here's what I am saying. They do not have the authority to say whether we will gather or not. You say, Pastor, you haven't seen Romans 13. Yes, I have seen it. I preached it. I've taught it in civil matters. As a citizen of the United States, I need to make sure I obey government. But I have two citizenships. And I can never forget that. And my citizenship in heaven trumps my citizenship on earth. And the government is not lord of the church. The CDC is not lord of the church. Who's stirring you up? Whose voice are you listening to? That's hard, isn't it? You can call me. I'll meet with you. I love you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love this church, right? But you, you need to answer that question. In the midst of this pandemic, you are paralyzed and gripped with fear. You can call that by a lot of names. But don't call it faith. Faith responds to the word of God. My, 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 my dear beloved sister and friend, the whole family, I love the Walker family. They know it too. They had to deal with this COVID-19. So you know, I'm calling, staying in touch with Brother Al and this is Jamaica, and so after the Lord brought them out, you know, and they got cleared, they all called me about coming back. I said, sure. And you know, 
this is a Jamaican and I, we kind of go back and forth a little bit. She said, and Pastor, I am going to give you a big hug. And I said, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> and she said, oh, yes, I am. And I said, Brother Al, get your wife. She's not. <laughs> Sunday they came back, and Brother Al came up to me, and my heart was just overjoyed to see him well. I know he had been in the hospital. And here comes Jamaica. I thought she was kidding me. Boom, like, it's COVID-19, God, stop touching me. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> I wasn't fearful. I'm not saying go practice that. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying faith responds to the word of God. Faith responds to the word of God. You're a citizen of heaven. John MacArthur in the Grace Community Church, the elders there, stood against the government that said they couldn't meet. They went to court and won. So how did they win, Pastor? Well, the Constitution, First Amendment. <laughs> okay? The Constitution, the First Amendment. Who's stirring you up? In the midst of the pandemic, make sure you are dominated and persuaded by the word of God more than anything else. Now listen, I'll hit you with another bomb and I'll move on. Who's the safest person in this passage? Who is the safest and most secure person in this passage I'm preaching? Well, it's not Pilate. It's not Pilate's wife. It's not the chief priests the scribes, the elders, is not the Sanhedrin, is not the crowd. Who's the safest person in this passage? It's Jesus. So wait a minute, pastor. He's on his way to the cross, correct. He's on his way to be crucified, correct. Well, why do you say he's the safest and most secure person? Because he's right in the center of God's will. And the center of God's will is always the safest place for a Christian. Always. Always. The safest place for a Christian is always the center of God's will. My mom stepped in here on the uh, other Sunday, well, before she got in. Uh, she was here last Sunday, but Sunday before as well. I'm, I'm in the fellowship hall. I just happened to see, it looked like my mom's car. So I hadn't spoken to her about coming or anything. So I went, I went out to the car and, and, and met her. And my first thought was, uh, look, mom, now I know about your underlining conditions. My first thought was to turn her around. But I asked her a question. I said, Mom, what are you doing here? She looked at me and she said, Son, I need to be here. So I walked her down this side and set her right over there where my nephew's sitting. <laughs> The safest place is always in the center of God's will. And again, I will lovingly, I know, I, 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 I know I'm scratching where you don't want me to scratch. I know I'm touching where you don't want me to touch. <laughs> I know I'm saying what you don't want me to say, but I will lovingly help you and share with you if you need to talk to me. Not arrogantly, I will lovingly, okay? So, the influence of the people and the major, primary, dominant stir and shaker and mover in our lives must be Christ and his word. Right? Must be. Listen, beloved, if I were 60, I'd have to retire from preaching according to CDC guidelines. You know that ain't happening. The inquiry from Pilate. 
right? You see the influence. They're stirring them up. Now, what's the inquiry from Pilate? And Pilate asked again, well, Pilate again said to them, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? Pilate is helpless right here. <laughs> Jesus is left on his hands and compelled. I, I've got to do something with him. <laughs> Pilate, the governor, the Roman governor. Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate, the Roman governor, the ruler of the, uh, uh, of the whole country, actually asked these Jews what to do with Jesus. Pilate, the one in authority, asked the people who were not in authority what to do with Jesus. You call him the Christ. I mean, excuse me, you call him king of the Jews. Matthew called him the Christ. Mark called him the king of the Jews. He wants to touch a favorable sentiment toward Jesus among the people. Surely you don't want me, Gentile Pilate, to put to death one you call king of the Jews. Surely you don't want me to do that. They're enraged. They're enraged. They will not tolerate this kind of king. They don't want a king like Jesus. Verses 13 and 14. Two things. You see the preference, right? In, in, in the preference, there's, there's some influence going on in the pre preference, right? There's some stirring up going on, and it's ungodly. There, there, there's this Roman governor named Pilate who's asking question after question. You know why? Because he really wants to release Jesus. He doesn't want to bow to him. He just wants him out of his court. I want you to see Verses 13 and 14, the irony of the crowd. You see verse 13? Are you with me? You gonna help me close this? The old preacher said, help me close it. <laughs> right? And they cried out again. Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So the people made their choice, stated their preference, and confirmed their sin. <laughs> That's what the religious leaders wanted. They got the mob worked up, turned them against Jesus. They shouted for the release of Barabbas. Prefer Barabbas over Jesus. What do you want me to do with him? They could have said, well, just give him 30 days suspended sentence. But you know what? We don't realize how much hatred is in the depraved, sinful heart against Jesus. They could have cried, just hold him a little while longer. Give him a slap on the wrist. But they cried, crucify him. You know what crucify means? To execute by nailing to a cross. That's the, that was the Roman penalty for rebellion against Rome. And Pilate had already concluded that there was no rebellion against Rome. And guess what? Only slaves or those who were not Roman citizens would be executed by crucifixion. So for Jesus to be executed, he had to be treated like a slave. If Jesus was crucified, he would die the death of a rebel and slave, not the king he claimed to be. 
so they think. So Pilate placed Jesus on a level with Barabbas. And they said, watch this. You've already got a cross made for Barabbas. Put Jesus on it. Hey, glory. I'm going somewhere with this. Are you with me? Come on, you're not too mad at me about the last point, are you? Follow me. <laughs> they demanded that Pilate issue the order, crucify Jesus. You know, crucifixion is one of the cruelest forms of punishment because the person not only was tortured to death, but the person was also made an open public shame. Come on, you Bible people, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? So, that's their goal of the priest. Kill Jesus. We want to, we want to make him a public shame. We, we want to humiliate him. Because we know, we do know this. They didn't know nothing about what Isaiah said. But they did know this. The law said anybody hung on a tree is under God's curse. Deuteronomy 21, 23. The priest will be pleased to see such a death that implies that Jesus is under God's curse. That's what we want. So the priest wants him to die the death of an accursed one. But wait a minute. The father... Jesus' Father, the Heavenly Father, is pleased as well because he wants Jesus to die the death of the cursed to fulfill his purpose and bear sin's curse for us. You've got two wheels going here. <laughs> One thing that they're, that they're actually getting rid of Jesus, but the, another wheel is at work. A sovereign wheel is at work. The will of the Holy God is at work. I let them do it, but they're doing it to fulfill my purpose. Follow me, I'm going somewhere. Pilate said, wait a minute, wait a minute. What evil has he done? What evil has he done? That's the final attempt. Pilate said, I'm going to make one more attempt. I, I, I'm going to ask them, what evil has this Jesus done? Give me sufficient cause. Tell me why he deserves to die. Well, surely the crowd's going to respond with some charges. These people at this point, they're a raging mob. They did not even respond to Pilate's question. The Bible says they shouted all the more, crucify him. In unison, crucify him. In unity, crucify him. No debate, Pilate. Put him on the cross. Pilate didn't like public pressure because he got in trouble uh, once before, before Caesar, so he didn't like public pressure. So, put him on the cross. That's what we want. We don't want to talk about anything else. We don't want to listen to any other reason. Just put him on the cross. Hallelujah. Pastor, I thought you said this was an ironic choice. Well, let me show you the irony. Jesus had no interest in causing any insurrection or leading any insurrection, any social upheaval. And Jesus is going to be crucified between two thieves, but Barabbas' homeboys, right? Barabbas was a, a, a robber guilty of murder. He's going to go free, and Jesus is going to take his place on a cross that was intended for Barabbas. Irony. The crowd chooses the one who takes the lives of others to achieve his own selfish ends, and the crowd condemns the one who gives life to others. 
Jesus. Irony. The crowd wants a king who, the, who, who, who they're comfortable with, a murderer, a, 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 a chaotic man. The crowd doesn't want a man who refuses to resist evil with violence. Irony. Irony. And you know what else is ironic? The renegades like Barabbas continued to spiral until eventually it erupted in war against Rome. Rome destroyed Jerusalem, the temple, and most of the inhabitants in a brutal siege. <laughs> so the chief priests fear Jesus because he's a threat to the temple, their power base, but in turn, they urge the release of one whose violent ways will eventually result in the destruction of their land. Irony. How many of you know sin never works out? <laughs> it just doesn't work out. You go against Jesus, you reject the Lord of glory, you go against him, it never turns out right for you. Listen, it always reverses itself back on you. And guess who ends up getting hurt? Sin is a destroyer, even when it doesn't look like it. Watch this. So, the crowd's rejection of Jesus involved the will of sinful men, men, right? But it also involved the will of God for a sacrificial lamb. More irony. Jesus is the scapegoat here, isn't he? <laughs> the guilt of, 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 of all of his people's sins are going to be transferred to him, right? Isaiah said, oh, I know what's going on. He's numbered with the transgressors, bearing the sin of many. Isaiah 53, 12. I want you to see something so ironic, but it's such a blessing. The crowd's rejection of Jesus actually spoke forth the will of God. Christ, as he stood covered with his people's sins, he had more sin laid on him than what rested on Barabbas. Y'all don't hear me? It's a good time to shout. <laughs> Jesus was without guilt, right? He was holy, harmless, undefiled, right? But he takes the load of your sins and my sins upon himself. And as God looks at him, he sees more guilt lying on the Savior than on the atrocious sinner, Barabbas. <laughs> you don't hear me, do you? Go ahead and shout, flowers. You know the lily of the valley. Glory to God. Is that not the truth? All of the weight and the guilt of our sins is on Christ now. And it's more sin on Christ than on Barabbas. Woo, what a preference. Notice lastly, under the preference, you see the influence of the, of the leaders, the inquiry of Pilate, trying to get him off, right? The irony of the people, Barabbas over Jesus. I can't leave this text without sounding this last gospel note, the illustration from the text. Is, do you think there's an illustration here of the gospel, of gospel truth? Come on now, we have Barabbas. They've been thrown into prison for an insurrection, started in the city, and for murder. He's a rebel, right? He's in prison for crimes he actually committed. He's everything that Jesus was not. Peter noted this contrast when he preached on the day of Pentecost, and this is what he said in Acts 3.14. He said, you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Wow. 
He is a sinner. He is the holiest, holy, harmless, undefiled Son of God. He is the Son of, of the Father Barabbas. He is the Son of the Father Jesus. Who does who is Barabbas an illustration of? Certainly not me, because I was brought up in a church, and I'm basically a good person. So I know I don't have any identity at all with Barabbas because I, I never killed anybody, and I, I'm just not like that. You know, I'm just not that kind of person. I'm, I'm basically a good person, and I'm, you know, I, I do good things for people. So who does Barabbas illustrate? All sinners in their fallen condition. He's not standing before us just as an individual. He represents uh, the human race in its present condition, fallen from God, a state of rebellion against the divine majesty of God, bound by the chains of the law to the day of judgment. Like Barabbas, we're everything Jesus is not. What do you mean, sinful, selfish, Rebellious against the rule, the word of God, and our guilty sin imprisons us and will not let us go. We're actually in bondage to our sinful nature, just like Barabbas. The holy law of God, we are broken, brings us under the judgment of God. And like Barabbas, we're on death row, just waiting because the penalty of sin is death, and after that, eternal punishment. But remarkably, I'm t telling my daddy to leave me alone. Oh, glory to God. Barabbas was set free, wasn't he? And his change took place. And I'm not saying Barabbas was saved. I'm talking about the illustration of the gospel. But he was set free. And, 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 and the point is that, that pardon here. It's a picture of the grace that God has for us in Jesus. We were dead, doomed to die, but a, an exchange took place. Jesus in our place. We take his. The innocent one is condemned to die in our place. The true son of the father will die for the true sons of the devil. Is that not right? But at the same time, the crucifixion of Jesus is our justification. The condemnation of Jesus is our pardon. And his bondage is our release. That's the gospel. Jesus dying in our place as our substitute, suffering the death we deserve to die. Right? Oh, my soul is on fire right now, but he himself took on the burden of our iniquities. He gave his son as a ransom for us, the holy one for transgressors like you and me, the blameless one for wicked people like you and me, the righteous one for unrighteous people like you and me, the incorruptible one for corruptible people like you and me, the immortal one for mortal people like you and me. Good night. What a benefit. I never saw that coming. I never dreamed in my life that the wickedness of so many would be uh, hid in a single righteous one. Christ dying for us. Oh my goodness. Justification through one man. <laughs> Isn't that good news? What a benefit. Who saw that coming? Barabbas didn't see it coming. I can imagine Barabbas sitting, sitting there in jail, and the guard comes, and Barabbas is like, oh my goodness, it's time. It's time for me to hang on that cross. And the guard comes, Barabbas! The, the other two thieves like, I guess we'll be right behind him. Barabbas! Barabbas says, yes! The guard says, come with me. The rabbi says, as he's walking, is it time? And the guard says, time for what? Time for me to go to that Roman cross? 
said, no. He said, where am I going? Pilate wants to see me one more time. He said, you're going home. There was nothing he could do to gain his own release. <laughs> he had no way of escape from the death penalty. Then why was he spared? Because Jesus died in his place. <laughs> you know that's good news, right? <laughs> Glory to God. You all better come on, Christian. <laughs> Glory to God. You know that's good news. I was on death row. The Holy Spirit came made me alive in Christ Jesus, my Lord. And where am I going now? I'm going home to be with Jesus. Set free from the curse of the law. Set free from the bondage of sin. Off death row, eternal life in me right now. Christ in me, the hope of glory right now. So I don't mind saying, I am Barabbas, set free, because Jesus died in my place. Isn't that good news? The gospel is the greatest news in the world. Nothing surpasses it. What will you do? With Jesus, will you receive him as Lord and Savior of your life by coming in repentance, turning from your life, faith, turning to Christ, trusting in him, relying on who he is and what he's done for your salvation alone, ready to give up everything to follow him, denying yourself to follow Christ, the best life in the world. Or will you identify with Pilate, the chief priests, the elders and the scribes, and the whole majority crowd to reject Jesus and pay for your own sin? While the choir sings, you ought to do holy business with the Lord.
I'll tell you one more thing about um, my sweet sister Jamaica. She and I were talking, and she just began to so clearly articulate the hand of God in, in the tornado in April, and talking to her pastor about the sovereignty of God, and I'm listening and being blessed. And then after she came through COVID, she went right back to the sovereignty of God understanding that it was good that I was afflicted. Amen. And all I said to her, I said, Tamika, you got it. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> well, Father, you're so awesome. As we continue to regather you just take us higher and higher. It is such a blessing. As David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And Heavenly Father, as I listen to of the eaves on Wednesday. I'm seeing more and more and more as you open up your word to us, the blessings of community and why we don't only need one another, but we must have one another. You created us as a community of believers with that understanding in mind. So Lord, I preach today, but I look forward to Wednesday for you to bless us again through the ministry of your word. I thank you so much for your people. I thank you for your people who have gathered. I thank you for your people who are watching at home. I thank you for your people who are not members of this church, but continue to gather with us. Thank you for the blessing of seeing my nephew today, his friend with him as well. I thank you for that, Heavenly Father. I just love people, dear God. You put it in me because it was not there before. <laughs> you put it in me. I thank you for that. We're departing from this place. Sanctify us through the truth of your holy word. Continue to let us see Christ, submit to Christ, live for Christ, live internally, externally for the glory and the honor of Christ. Studying your word, obeying your word, sharing your word. Strengthen us, Lord God. Strengthen us in our relationships with one another. Most of all, may we grow in our devotion and love for Christ. May that love just flow everywhere. Our feet plants us. Lastly, I ask that you would say, I don't know, dear, dear Father, but you know, I don't know who may be listening to us by way of live stream that is not yet saved, but you know, save Heavenly Father by your grace, for your glory. Sweet, apart from this place, protect us, dear God. Oh, we'll wear our mask and we'll clean our hands. But our trust is in you to protect us. And not only from the virus, dear God, protect us from the flesh, the world, the devil, that threefold enemy. For Father, that danger is worse than Corona. Protect us, dear God. 
Now may your grace, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with your people now and forevermore. Let all of the redeemed of the Lord say with me, amen.